All right, so hi everybody. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Cormac Kickett, who is a honor student here. He's just finishing up. So we started this work about two years ago when he was a summer scholar with me, and he's pretty good. We got we got a tableau paper out of his summer scholar work, and this is what we've been doing for the last two years or so. Um, there's lots of mumbo jumbo words on there. I'm assuming most of you know what they are, but it's okay. I'll I'll go through. The details of um, uh, what every everything means here. So the area that I work, or the area of this paper, is automated reasoning for multimodal logics. Right. So we're trying to find fast decision procedures for modal satisfiability, and then or validity, depending on which way you want to look at it. Um, this is the. Uh, hang on. Why can I not go? Okay. This is the overview of the talk. I'm just going to let you read that for a bit. Um, and my assumption, as I said, is that most people know what modal logics are, but they might not know what tableau calculi are, and they might not know what sat solvers are. Mm. I'm going to intersperse the experimental results with the talk because that way, you know, if I don't get to the end, Hopefully, I'll still have piqued your interest. And, you know, my main motivation here is to get you to read our papers. It's an advertisement for the paper, really. And contact me if you're interested in following up in any way. For example, Dominic, if you wanted to formalize this stuff, that would be a welcome addition. Um, all right. So given the small audience here, please stop me at any time. Right. If you don't understand something, either put up your hand um, and get Guillermo to interrupt me, or just interrupt me if you're online and say, "Hey, I have a question." Right. So, okay, let's go. So, what have we got? Okay, modal logics. I'm assuming most of you know what it is. So, we've got classical propositional logic here. Can you see my pointer, by the way? Yep, we can. Yeah, we can. You can see the pointer, right? And then what have we got? We've got two unary connectives, a box and a diamond. Um, various readings of box, typically from philosophy, it's A is necessary so that the diamond becomes A is possible. The diamond is the De Morgan dual, the negation dual of box. And all of these other words that I put in here, like description and ALC, AI, is because there's another parallel community that have basically reinvented modal logic in the artificial intelligence research work, logical logics in artificial intelligence. And they've given these logics different names. So I just wanted to keep them on board in case there were some people in the audience from that community. So for example, in AI, they typically think of box A as A is believed, and then Diamond A becomes not A is not believed, or A is known, then not A is not known, and so on. There are many, many interpretations. Just to make things concrete, what sort of proof system might, might we have for these logics? Well, just take the traditional Hilbert calculus with modus ponens, um, all instances of the Kripke axiom, which says that box distributes over uh, implication, and a rule of necessitation from A infer box A. Um, this is what Ian and some other people in the audience would probably call weak deduction or something like that, right? So we don't have a set of global assumptions or we don't have a set of assumptions from which we do deduction. But let's, I just wanted to keep it simple for now. I, I can give uh, Hilbert Calculi for the stronger notion, but Hilbert Calculi are not going to reappear again after this slide, so it wasn't worth it. And then what? Well, then you add axioms such as box A implies A, which is called typically called T. Box A implies box X A, which is four. And there are five. There are there are many many extensions, but there are five basic extensions which give you what what's called the modal cube. So fifteen basic modal logics. Um, okay, Kripke frames. Again, I'm assuming you know what these are, but I just want to go over them in case there's someone who doesn't know. So what are Kripke models? So we have a graph of possible worlds with directed edges, and I'll describe what these are in a minute. So what do we have? We have a, a non-empty set of possible worlds, typically, typically called W, V, X, Y, Z. We have a binary relation over W. So if this pair is in the relation, 
then there is an arrow from W to V. And what's this var theta? Well, it says you give me a, a little W from the possible worlds, you give me an atom from your set of formulae, and I'll tell you whether that atom is true or false at that world, right? So it's a valuation at a world of the atoms. And so we'll write W forces P exactly when P is true at W. That's what this means. P is true at W. What do we do for conjunction distinctions? Well, they're local. So you say W makes a conjunction true if and only if it makes each conjunct true. And similarly for disjunction, uh, negation, and implication. And it's these guys that are interesting. So suppose we're at a world W, which makes box A true. That's this guy. So what does the condition say? It says, wherever you can go from here with one step, well, that guy has to make A true. So wherever you can go from here in one step, they have to make A true. And what about diamond? Well, if W makes diamond A true, then it says there has to be at least one R successor, V, which makes A true. So this is a, the diamond is an existential over successors, and the box is a universal over successors. And again, we have many extensions. So you get conditions on R like reflexivity. So every world sees itself. Transitivity, if X sees Y and Y sees Z, then X sees Z, and so on. There are many, many of them. So what's modal satisfiability? It's a double existential. It says phi is true in some world in some community model. And what's validity? It's a double universal. It says phi is true in every world of every Kripke model. And of course, there's a duality between them, which says phi is valid if and only if not phi is not satisfiable. Any questions on that or can I go on? I think it's all good so far here. in the Okay. Yes. Okay. So now by far the most popular proof calculi for Tableau, sorry, for modal logics, are not the Hilbert systems that I showed you earlier, because it's very difficult to find proofs in those. And so, you know, typically, even when teaching, you teach Tableau calculi. So this is this is a brief introduction to Tableau calculi, just in case you don't know what they are. Now, in order to keep the number of rules small, I'm going to put the formula into something that's called negation normal form. So what do I do? I, t I rewrite any implication as not A or B. And then I push negations downwards using the De Morgan dualities. So if this was a conjunction, then I would push the negation through the conjunction, turn it into a disjunction. If this was a disjunction, I would push the negation through and turn it into a conjunction and so on. So what does that allow me to do? It allows me to give you only four rules. Tableau calculus with all, only four rules for the modal logic K. So what are these rules built out of? Well, X and Y are finite sets, and I'm going to use comma to mean set partition. So for example, above the line here, I have some set which I can partition into two. One is a conjunction, and the other is a some unknown set of formulae. But the partition says that the A and B does not occur in X, right? So there are no identical formula to A and B in X. And this helps us with termination. And then what does the rule do? It says, well, just delete the A and B and replace it with the conjuncts. And similarly for the others. Whereas what this rule says is don't do anything because you found a contradiction. Right, so this thing sort of says stop. So we're going downwards and we're applying these rules. The disjunction says, um, you know, make two children with a left child and a right child. And the left child gets A, the, left, the right child gets B, and you copy the X across. And this is the interesting rule here. It says, um, pick a diamond, any diamond, out of some set of diamonds, which you've got. Collect all the boxes together and then undiamond the diamond that you've picked, unbox all of the boxes and throw away the other diamonds and throw away this thing. And this thing has to be a set of literals, right? Which are atoms and negated atoms. So there's a restriction on this, right? Which says 
you can't have conjunctions, disjunctions, and so on in here. So what this is doing is effectively saying that you have to apply the rules in left to right order, right? By the time you get to this rule, there are no conjunctions, sorry, no conjunctions, no disjunctions, and no contradictions, because you would have tried these rules already. That's why this thing is just atoms and their negations with no contradictions, right? So this is actually a decision procedure. So let's have a look at an example. So we know that the K axiom should be valid because it was one of the axioms of our Hilbert calculus. So here's an instance of it. So what do we do? Well, tableau calculi are like proofs by contradiction. So first of all, you negate this formula. You put it up here. And then we're going to put it into NNF. So we're going to push this negation through. So what does the negation do? It leaves this guy alone and changes this to a conjunction. So there's that guy. Then it comes and sits outside here, which says leave this guy alone and change this to a conjunction. That's that guy there. And then the negation is going to come and sit outside this box, which will push through the box and turn it into a diamond not Q. Okay. And then we'll have this P implies Q left, which we'll rewrite as not P or Q. So hopefully you'll see that this is the negation normal form of this. No implications. And every negation sits on top of an atom. Any questions? Because you might not have seen this before. It okay. doesn't look like uh, it's all good. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> so now what? Well, let's start. So we'll apply the AND rule twice. So what does the AND rule say? It just says, turn it into a semicolon, right? So this gets turned into a semicolon. This gets turned into a semicolon. Everything gets left alone. There are no disjunctions, no contradictions, so we can apply this rule. So what does it say? It says pick a diamond, any diamond. Well, there's only one. Undiamond it. Collect all the boxes together into a set and unbox them. So these are all the boxes. They're unboxed. Throw away the other diamonds. There weren't any. Throw away the literals. There weren't any. So this is the conclusion of this rule here. Now what? Well, now we've got an occurrence of a disjunction, so we start all over again. So what does the disjunction rule say? It says go left and go right, copy the context X, copy the context X, and put the left child with not P and create a right child with Q. And what you'll see is that there's a contradiction here and that there's a contradiction here. Remember, order doesn't matter because these are sets, right? So the fact that these are you know far apart is relevant. So we've got a closed tableau, and what is the complete Wait, yeah, Raj, one second. Uh, yeah. Mari has a question. Let me just. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not complicated. Sorry to break your throat. So, hey, what does it kind of mean? <laughs> is that the, the K rule, you throw away diamond and. Oh, things. okay. Yeah, sure. I wasn't going to go into it, but uh, good question. What's going on here is we're implementing the semantics of diamond and box, right? So imagine we're in a world where all these guys are true, right? Pull it W. Then what does it mean for W to make diamond A true? It means that there's a successor which makes A true. So this is the successor of W. And then the boxes come along and say, well, if box is true at w then every successor has to make x true so that's why the x's are there does that does that help or do you want me to go back to here for example right the diamond says create a successor and the box says propagate or everything under the box to the successor so together if you think of the diamond and the boxes they're all encapsulated in this rule does that help? Yeah, yeah. Apparently it does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So I mean, if if you know tableau, you know that originally they come from Beth, right? And they're called semantic tableau. And the reason is because basically we're encoding the semantics of modal logic into rules. All right. And then we can talk about it as a formal proof system. And it's only recently that people have realized that, you know, these are just upside down Genson calculi, for example. Again, if that doesn't mean anything to you, please don't worry. But if it does, then, you know, that's that's relevant as well. 
Okay. Yep. All good. All okay. Good. All right. Fine. So, uh, oops, sorry. So, what's the game that I've been playing for the last twenty-five years? Well, the game is that you know you take this basic calculus for k, and you do other logics by adding more rules and possibly replacing k by different rules. Right. That's basically what modal tableau calculi do. And there are you know, well. There's a handbook chapter on it, for example, right? And you can make a living out of this. So what are the rules? Well, this is the rule here for T, which is the box P implies P. This is the rule for K4, which is box P implies box box P. Again, I just want to go through some examples to ground your intuitions. So suppose we wanted to prove that this was a theorem. Then what do we do? We negate it. We push the negation through so that this becomes a conjunction. The negation comes and sits here. That's the negation normal form. And now we apply the rules, right? The conjunction rule says just turn this into a semicolon. And now we would stop. Because if you look at this set of rules here, none of them are applicable, right? There's no contradiction. There are no more conjunctions. There are no more disjunctions. And there are no more diamonds. So this guy in the proof system for K would not be able to proceed. But what we do in order to capture the T axiom here is just say, well, whenever you see a box, just unbox the box and leave everything else the same, All right? Notice it's unbox the box and leave everything else the same. Contrast that with he here, where you unbox the box only if there's a diamond and delete stuff. Right, so this rule and this rule are very, very different, right? This one just doesn't need any diamonds. This one needs diamonds. But this is exactly what we need. Look, we've got no diamonds. We unbox the box, we get a P, and now we've got a contradiction, right? So this is the, so if you take this proof system and add this rule, you get um, a proof system for this logic. If you want to handle this logic, what you do is you re replace this rule with this rule and get rid of this guy again. So the proof system is now classical logic plus this guy. Let's just work through it. So this should be a theorem. We negate it. The negation turns this into a conjunction and turns this into a diamond, this into a diamond, and the negation comes and sits outside the, not the P there. That's what's going on here. We apply the AND rule, turns it into semicolon, there are no disjunctions, no contradictions, but there is a diamond, right? Now, you can try this at home if you want. If you try this rule, it won't work. What we need is this rule. So that's why this says K4 here, right? So what does it say? It says undiamond the diamond, unbox the boxes, throw away the under, uh, other diamonds, throw away the literals, but keep a copy of the box formulae. So let's do it. So undiamond the diamond, unbox the box and keep a copy of the box. Undiamond the diamond, unbox the box and keep a copy of the box. And lo and behold, we've got a contradiction. So we can prove the four axiom in this proof system. The problem now is of course, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So here is an example of a K4 tableau that goes into a loop. So you apply the AND rule, you undiamond the diamond, you unbox the box, and you copy the box. You undiamond the diamond, unbox the box, and copy the box. And now we've got the same thing over and over again. So what you have to do in this case is if you want a decision procedure, you have to keep track of the nodes that you've seen, which is typically called a loop check, right? Just look at all the ancestors back up to the root. And if you see the same thing again, stop because continuing on is just stupid because you're just going to do the same stuff over and over again. And the theorem states that these are terminating sound and complete tableau calculi for the logics that are associated with these conditions, right? With these axioms. So that was the old way. Okay. Any questions before I go on? No? One second here. Mara, yeah. I have to go there. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Mara is asking, what is S4? S4 is the logic 
back here where you have Kripke worlds and the relation R is both reflexive and transitive. So every world sees itself. So every world has an R loop going to itself. And if X sees Y and Y sees Z, then X sees Z. Sorry, and James has a question as well. Sure. I'm just going to, I'm going to leave the microphone. <laughs> yeah. uh, just wanted to check from, it looks to me from intuition that basically whenever we're running a tableau of this, you'll only ever be able to apply run one rule in any situation. Is that correct? Like, like it's fully determined when you start running these tableaus. Not quite. No. Oh. So for example, I can give you a set which has A and B and C or D. Right. If I gave you a set with A and B or C or D, then you could either apply this rule or you could apply this rule. All right. It's in the partition. You could, you've got options with partitions, I guess. And you could apply K or K4. Depending on the no, no, no. K, well, we and K, K. K and K4 will never live together. Right. But the question, it's a good question. What it's saying is if I have a conjunction and a disjunction at the top level, what should I do first? Right. And the answer is you should do the conjunction first. Why? Because look, it only creates one child, right? And you never know. This might be a P and this might be a not P. And so you can stop immediately and you don't have to do the disjunction. But the disjunction is more work because it creates two children and you have to close both children. Now, in the background here is some proof theory which says it doesn't matter which order you apply these rules in. But it does matter whether you apply this guy before these guys or not, which is why what I've done, so the question is, is very pertinent. What I've done is I've determinized this rule, which says this is just a set of atoms and negations of atoms. In other words, if there was a conjunction here, you couldn't apply this rule, you'd have to apply this rule first. Does that help or hinder? You know, no, yeah. So, so basically, the logic, the logic of the, of the whatever the K or the K four, whatever rule, gives us an implicit decision procedure. Yes, okay, fine. You have choice on the conjunction or the disjunction, but who cares? Because, like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. And you, you also have choice in K. Right, you're choosing which diamonds to apply to. Yeah. I guess right. part of the reason I was asking this was with the loop check, it feels like the loop should, in order for us to know the loop check is going to work, you need some kind of confidence that like, because, because just seeing the same formula twice, if you have options, if if it's a, um, indeterministic what's going to happen as you play things out, then it feels to me that seeing a loop isn't enough, right? Because it's like, well, what if I go the other way this time? And then whatever, in, in a sufficiently complicated circumstance, you could imagine falling into a loop where if you'd gone the other way, you would have escaped it. Right. No, no, no. So remember what I said. You've got a unique path back to the root, okay? okay? But that doesn't mean, so you could be on this guy, but you still have to close the other guy, right? But what happens is you don't get any crosstalk between the branches. If we got crosstalk between the branches, then you'd get the situation that, is it Mario is asking about, right? No, 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 James. Uh, oh, wait, James. James, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Okay. So so the idea is there from any node, there's a unique path back to the root. And if you see the same node twice, then all you're going to do is you're going to keep on doing the same stuff over and over again on this branch. Yeah. OK, I think that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. But the, again, the question is a good one. Let's look at the dual situation. What happens if the tableau remains open? Right. The completeness proof says, well, I have to be able to give you a counter model. Right. That's when you have to take worry about loops and following other branches. But it can be done. So the question is very good. Right. It's very, very uh, pertinent. But believe me, um, there are ways that we can deal with it. Is that OK? Yeah, no, that I think um, makes sense. OK. All right. So as I said, that was the old way. What are SAT solvers? Well, they're just extremely efficient decision procedures for CPL satisfiability. Look, this is essentially 
CPL satisfiability, right? It's a decision procedure for classical propositional logic. So why not just replace this with these very efficient SAT solvers, which the AI community and the computer science people have worked on for the last 20 years with amazing results? So I'm going to keep it high level. What's a SAT solve? So what's a CPL valuation? So var theta is just an assignment of truth values to the atoms. There are no modalities, right? So it's just P1 is true, P2 is true, P3 is false, Q5 is false, and so on, right? And what does a SAT solver do? You give it a finite set Z of CPL formulae, so no modalities, and it gives you back two results. If it says yes, it gives you a valuation, which is this thing, an assignment of truth values to atoms, so that the whole set is CPL satisfiable under that valuation. Otherwise, it says no and gives you back what's called a conflict set. And what's a conflict set? It's a subset of Z, which is CPL unsatisfiable. So what they're trying to do, and they're getting better and better at this, is they're trying to pinpoint the cause of the unsatisfiability of Z. Right? We know Z itself is CPL unsatisfiable, but you know it could be a whole lot of stuff with just a P and a not P, a single occurrence of a P and a not P in there. Then that's what this thing will give you. It'll give you that P and not P. So it's pinpointing the cause of the contradiction. Any questions? Doesn't look like, no. no. All good. Okay. All right. So in order to use these set solvers, we need a normal form. So we see we saw a negation normal form. In order to use them, we need something called clausal normal form. And it's just this. So we'll say that every atom and its negation is a literal. A clause is just a disjunction of literals. So you bring all the negated literals up to the front, say, because or is commutative. You push all the positive ones to the end. And now what you can do is you can rewrite it by pulling the negation out, turning this guy into an implication, and then just rewriting this as conjunctions. Right? So what the clause says is, if A1 and da 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 A L are true, then one of these guys has to be true. That's all. There's nothing deep there. And what's clausal normal form? It's just a conjunction of these guys. So each one of these is a is a uh, a clause, and there's just k of them, right? That's all. Why? Well, because you give me any formula phi of CPL. And I can put it into a normal form formula, which is only polynomially longer, which is equisatisfiable. What do I mean by equisatisfiable? It means if the original formula is satisfiable, so is the CNF. And if the CNF is satisfiable, then so is the original. And what's good about these things is that these modern SAT solvers can handle CNFs with thousands of clauses and thousands of propositional variables. So that's the oracle that I want to use to replace these guys, right? Again, I'm keeping it at a very high intu intuition level, right? I'm going to replace this with a SAT solver, and then I'm going to implement this in some way around the SAT solver. That's the intuition of what's going on. Any questions? So Yeah, yeah, we have one. One second. Take it. So when it says no CS, it gives you the conflict set. Does it also give you the reason why, if it's not just P and not P, does it give you the, if it's like a huge conflict set, does it also tell you why it's It does, absolutely. But this will always be a subset of Z, right? Okay, In other it doesn't words, derive but, anything... Yeah, yeah, so this will be a set of atoms, atomic formulae, which appear inside Z, right? Okay. So potentially so it, it could be the whole of Z. If it could be the whole of Z, but it'll never be bigger. And, and, and the word you use is absolutely spot on. It's the reason why Z is unsatisfiable, right? So it's, it's pointing you to where the con where the con where the con how the contradiction arises in Z. Okay. And we'll use that in a minute. 
right? Right. Okay. All right. So this is the question that I've been battling with for the last 10, 12 years or so, right? So I showed you these modal tableau, right? But there's a whole community working on this modal satisfiability problem. And we've got, you know, at least five, six methods. But there's no way that we've been able to match the advances made in these SAT solvers until Cormac came along. And we published this paper here. Now, I'm claiming a quantum loop, quantum leap, right? So I better give you the proof of the pudding. So here are the results from our 2021 paper. I'm just going to let you read those for a minute, and I'll explain what's going on. Okay, so there's, there's a bunch of standard benchmarks. There's a bunch of um, provers from different communities. So, you know, uh, this is a resolution theorem prover. It's fine if you don't understand what it is. It's just a, another method. This is a first order theorem prover, which tries to handle propositional logics. This one is a previous attempt to use a SAT solver. This one is from this uh, description logic community. It's one of the best provers that they've got. This one is something that one of my PhD students and I came up with. And this is a highly optimized Tableau prover, right? With lots and lots of tricks under the hood. And what do you see? Okay, so what you see is that we come second to the resolution theorem prover here in this benchmark, but we are two orders of magnitude faster. What they can do in 15 seconds, we can do in half a second, right? Over here, we are one magnitude faster. What they can do in 15 seconds, we can do in one. And something similar over here. What they can do in, say, one, let's just say one, one order of magnitude, right? So we're seeing orders of magnitude speed ups over stuff that's been out there for the last 25 years. If we now go to the logic KT and S4, we see similar behavior. So this is an order of magnitude speed up. And this is the one that really drives home the, the point. They can't even solve the 400 problems in 15 seconds. And if you have a look at these curves, you know, it's going to take them, what, somewhere out here, say. It might be 30 seconds before they can solve 400 problems. So this really is a big deal, right? Okay, so what do we need to do that? So the new way is to replace the CBO, CPL Tableau rules with a SAT solver. But now what? Well, now we need a yet another normal form. So what we do is we convert something to, you give me a formula phi, I'll negate it and convert it to something called modal clausal normal form. So what does it look like? Well, you get a set of clauses as usual, conjunctions of disjunctions of literals, and you get some new stuff, which is a literal implies a box literal, or a literal implies a diamond literal. And there's some number of those, and there's some number of those. That's it, right? And what you get is you get a formula that looks like this. So you give me a phi naught, I negate it, I put it into NNF form, and then I put it into MCNF form. And what I get is I get something with zero boxes out the front. And what's this? It's a collection of things that looks like this. Then I get something with one box out the front. And what's this? It's something that looks like this. And so on up to kappa. So you get kappa boxes out the front. And this guy looks like this. And what's kappa? Kappa, kappa is the modal depth of the original formula that you gave me. So there's a bound. Right? And I can tell you exactly what the bound is. What we're going to do is we're going to explore um, this uh, formula essentially using a SAT solver and the K rule. Are there any questions? No, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a normal form. The next example will give you give you a feeling for what it is. Okay, so here's the tableau for the same thing that I did before, right? But using these SAT solvers. So what do I do? I start off here with the negation normal form. So I showed you how to put it into negation normal form on a previous site. So just hopefully you'll accept this. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to give names to subformulae. 
So I'm going to give this guy a new name. Let's call it C1. So if C1 is true, then box diamond, uh, diamond not Q is true. I'm going to give this guy a name. Let's call it A2. So if A2 is true, then box P is true. I'm going to give this guy a name. Let's call it A1. It's a box formula. So A1 implies some box formula. Well, why is it a B1? Well, because the thing underneath the box is complicated. So I'll give it a name. I'll call it B1. And what does B1 say? Well, B1 says, well, if I'm true, then not P or Q is true, which is exactly this guy. Right? So all I've done is I've renamed subformulae, and I've pushed the name for B1, I've pushed out by one box. Why? Because this is this idea that there's some stuff with zero boxes, but then there's some stuff with one box, right? So this renaming is pushed out by one. Now, all this is well and good, but what this says is that this is true, and this is true, and this is true. Well, what I've got is I've got, you know, contingencies here. What if C1 is false? Then this one doesn't work. So what I do is I insist that C1 is true and A2 is true and A1 is true. Now look, I've got a modus ponens, a hidden modus ponens between A1 and A1 implies box B1, which is going to give me this guy. I've got a hidden modus ponens between A2 and this guy, which is going to give me the box P. And I've got a hidden modus ponens between C1 and this guy, which is going to give me the diamond not Q. So this set of MCNF clauses does capture this formula. So what do I do now? I take the classical part of this, I ignore the box stuff, and I call the SAT solver, right? So the SAT solver called on this says, yeah, sure, I can give you a valuation which makes all these guys true. Just make them true. So this is the valuation that the SAT solver gives me. So what do I do? I now go over to the other side and say, okay, I know that the valuation makes the classical part true. Let's see what happens with respect to the modal part. So if A1 is true, then I'm going to get a box B1. If A2 is true, I'm going to get a box P. And if C1 is true, then I'm going to get a diamond not Q. Ah, wait, if I've got a diamond not Q, then I must have a successor with not Q. And if I've got a box P, then that successor must make P true. And if I've got a B1, then that successor must make B1 true. And if I've got a successor, then anything on the under a box comes along for the ride. So now, this is the original world, uh, Kripke world, and this is its successor. But look, this is also of the form MCNF. It's just that there are no modal clauses here. So I call it again with a SAT solver. And what do I get? It says, no, it's unsatisfiable. Why? Because the B1 fires this and gives me a not P or Q. The P clashes with the not P there and gives me a Q. And the Q clashes with that and gives me unsat. Now, what are the what's the reasons for this unsatisfiability? It's exactly these three guys, because I had to use all of them. So what do I do? I come back here and I say, look, this valuation that you gave me was no good. It doesn't satisfy the modal clauses that I need to satisfy. Give me a different one. What's the easiest way to say, give me a different one, is to say, well, give me the negation of the conjunction. So this says A1 is true, A2 is true, and C1 is true. So what I do is I learn a clause which says one of them has to be false. That's that clause down here. And I restart this guy. So I go back to the original world and say, hey, I learned something. This valuation is no good. Give me a different one. And now I call the SAT solver again. And it's going to give me unsat. Why? Because look, this thing says all three of these have to be true. And this says one of them has to be false. It's not possible. Any questions? Uh, I've, got, I've got a question. So yeah. because the SAT solver will um, return some satisfying assignment, but not necessarily a fixed one. It will return one of them. Um, when you run this process, you will have a, it's a non-deterministic generation of the of the whole, whole diagram because that depends on the, 
in which order the set solver outputs the assignments. Yep. But you get around this by learning the learning exactly. these clauses. Okay. Yep. So this is essentially backtracking into the SAT solver and saying, give me another one if you have any. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? This is yeah, a backtrack but... mechanism into the SAT solver. Mm -hmm. Right? I've got another question. question. Yeah. Yes. Um, when I saw, well, this overall approach reminds me of work that uh, Valentin Moumirai and others from Krill did uh, with a tool called Ricar, where they were solving... Um, model logic by calls to set solvers. Um, and um, yeah, it was similar to the SIGAR approach in, in uh, model checking. And I was wondering if there was any connection and similarities with uh, what you're doing. Okay, I was hoping to avoid this question, but <laughs> you've asked it. Um, what we found is that their prover is unsound. So their 2017 each Kai paper is completely undermined because their implementation is unsound. So I've had a conversation over Zoom with Daniel and he's currently employing an engineer to completely rewrite, is it Mosaic or something, right? Their prover is called Mosaic and there's some deep, deep rooted bug in there. Yeah. But Cormac has also done some experiments against Recar, the Recar approach. So what he did is he's, is he actually re-implemented Recar in mm -hmm. the uh, cigar, cigar box framework that we've got. And our latest results show that we're better. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I, I think that the overall approach was uh, made sense, but I heard I also heard that they, they did not have a good implementation, that it was buggy and we could not rely on their, on their numbers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you reproduced it and it does not compare well to, to the new right. thing. It's not, as, it's not as good as what we're doing, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. What about extensions? So this is where, you know, it really starts to look beautiful. So what happens is, remember how I showed you that you get this normal form with these um, zero boxes, one boxes up to K boxes. So what we do is we just implement it as a linked list, which, okay, they, we call it a try, but it's just a linked list. You get, a, you get rid of all the boxes outside and you just put C0 in here, you put a pointer to C1, put a pointer to C2 and so on, right? So this is a finite length linked list. This is kappa, the maximal modal degree of the original formula that you gave me. Now, what I showed you basically just walks down this list, right? It calls a set solver on this, goes to there, then calls a set solver and this goes to there. And somewhere if it finds unset, it backtracks to here and you know, learns a clause and calls the sat solver again. So it's walking up and down this list. Um, what about extensions? Let's have a look at box P implies P. Well, look, if box P implies P, then box C1 implies C1. So you can put the C1 in here. And box two C2 implies box one C2. So you can put the C2 in here, which gives you a box C2, and then put the box uh, the C2 in here. So what you get is you get all these guys come backwards to the root and you get an ascending chain of sat solvers. What about transitivity? It's the opposite. If you see a box C1, it says box box C1. So the C1 comes and lives here, which then pushes it here, pushes it here and pushes it all the way out. And so what you get is you get an ascending chain of sat solvers. And if you put them together, you get exactly two levels. You get one set solver that lives with all of these guys, takes care of all of these guys, and it's pointing to one another set solver that's taking care of all of these guys. That's it. You get a level two procedure. Um, we need to do a bit more work. So suppose you've got it A implies box B in any one of these contexts. Well, if you have reflexivity, then box B implies B. So you just add this. So what you're doing is you're adding the instance of reflexivity that you need and if you have transitivity then box b implies box box b so you just say a implies box a right so a is literally a, like a fixed point why because a implies box b box b implies box box b and that's just the same as box a because a implies box b so you're wiring in the exact instances of the axioms that you need Oh, 
Any questions there before I go on? Doesn't look like. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. This is this is where you now start to read the paper, right? If you if you're liking what you're seeing. Okay. So what have we done since then? So Robert MacArthur was another summer scholar with me. He refactored everything to C plus plus, and then Cormac has picked up that implementation and extended in two directions, which I want to talk to you about. So one is we can handle multiple modalities. And why is that interesting? Because the AI people like that, right? So they want diamond one to be believes and they want diamond, sorry, uh, box one to be believes and box two to be knows and box three to be is necessary or something like that. And the other way that we've extended it is to just handle the five basic extensions with um, uh, seriality, reflexivity, symmetry, uh, transitivity, and Euclideanness. So if you don't know what they are, these are the axioms, and these are the first order conditions that correspond to them. I want to go a little bit faster, if I may. So intuitively, what we need to do is we need to find the transformations as I showed you for K and T, right? So this sort of stuff. How do we take the original MCNF and modify it to build in the particular axioms? So again, I don't want to go into the details. I just want to show you the results. And so I think this is why I needed to make this bigger. Just want to show you here, we've got, you know, some bunch of uh, provers from the resolution committee, community, that's these two. And we've got some variants of our cigar tableau procedure. And again, as you see, you know, where this is the best one here, we've got something like uh, two orders of magnitude, right? 250, what they can do in 250, we can do in two. Um, similar thing over here, what they can do in 250, we can do in say four. Um, what they can do in 250, we can do in 0.25. That's three orders of magnitude. That's three orders of magnitude. That's an order of magnitude. So again, I don't want to harp on this too much. I just want to say, if you're interested, please read the paper, right? So these res results are there. Hasn't been published yet, but we can send it to you. What I did want to talk about, oh, sorry. Okay. What about... Um, splitting this up into the SAT and unsat classes. So these problems consist of 100 satisfiable formulae and 100 unsatisfiable formulae. And, you know, maybe there's a difference. Maybe tableau calculi are really good at SAT. And so, you know, if we just have lots of SAT problems, then we're winning. But as you can see, it's not the case. There are 100 of each. And this is the only class in which the other provers equal the results that we're getting. And in every other class, the results that we're getting is better. So, you know, this is a uniform gain. It's not just on the satisfiable class classes or the unsatisfiable classes. We're actually winning in every um, class. Okay. All right. Now, how long, how much longer do I have? So you should have, since we started five minutes later, uh, so 11 minutes. In okay, total. fine. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to speed up a little bit because I think most of the audience knows what modal logics are. All right. So I'm going to try and concentrate on the cigar aspects. So what's tense logic? Well, it's just you add a black box and a black diamond. And a black diamond says there is a predecessor. And a white, uh, sorry, a black box says for all predecessors. Right. So you've got one reachability relation. And the white boxes look forward along it, and the black boxes look backwards along it. Okay. Now what? We've got Kripke models, and all of this just says what I just said here, right? The, the, the black diamond is a predecessor. The black box is all predecessors. So what happens? Well, you get a slightly more complicated plausible normal form. Not only do you get things like, that look like this, you get things that look like this. A literal implies a black box literal. A literal implies a black diamond literal, which is pretty um, expected, right? Now what? You get, again, an equisatisfiable set of formulae. It's just that now you get you know, zero boxes, one white box, one black box. 
uh, two white boxes, two black boxes, K white boxes, K black boxes. And you also get the intermediate ones, right? So one white, one black, uh, one white, two black, and so on. I don't want to go into the details. I just want to show you what's going on. So what we now need is a procedure that allows us to jump both forwards and backwards. So initially what we thought is, right, you just, you just let it run, right? And let it run backwards and forwards. But there's a problem because the past and future modalities are not independent. So they're connected by a notion of residuation, which is this, that if A implies box B is tense logically valid, then black diamond A implies B is tense logically valid, right? I've got a proof of that here, but I want to skip this and I'll come back to this if, there are, if there's anyone that really wants me to go through this. What we need to do is whenever we see an A implies box B, we need to encode black diamond A implies B, right? We need to encode this guy, but our normal form doesn't allow it. The diamond's on the wrong side. So we beat our head against a brick wall for a long time until we realized that, look, this is just the contrapositive of this. And this is of the right form. So what happens is the lemma becomes this. And all you do is you say, if you see an A implies box B in some node, then put, put the, this guy into, the, into its successor. And if you see this guy, then put this guy into the predecessor. And there are some other modifications which blow things up. I don't want to go into the details, but you need a clever data structure to manage this. And Cormac came up with it. So what do I want to do? I want to go through an example quickly. All right. So here's black diamond white box of something implies the something. Here's the negation normal form. And here's the MCNF. So we've got a C1. A C1 implies a black diamond, D1. So this D1 will be the name for this guy. So D1 is the name for a white box, B1. And what's B1? It's the name for this guy. So B1 says P and B1 says Q and so on. So what happens is we get this normal form. And because of this residuation, this guy causes us to add this guy. And now if we run the procedure, we get unset. So I'll just go through with it. So we call of this, this is all the classical stuff. We call it a SAT solver. It gives us some valuation. We jump. So C1 says black diamond D1. So that's where this guy come from. The B1 bar says black box D1 bar. So this is where the D1 bar comes from. And the A1 doesn't really give us any information. We call the SAT solver. It says, no, these are unsatisfiable. So what do we do? We go back here and we learn that C1 was the cause of the D1 via this, and B1 was the cause of the D1 bar, which was also a problem. So this guy and this guy, the conjunction is a conflict. So let's learn the negation. So either this has to be false or this has to be false. And B1 bar being false just means that B1 is true. Now you call the SAT solver and returns unsat. Why? Look, C1 kills that, so you get a B1. The B1 fires a P, the B1 fires a Q, but the A1 has fired a not P or Q. And so the P cancels with that, the Q cancels with that, and you get unsat. So we get completeness. And these are the results. And so again, what you see is what the best description logic prover can do in, what, 120 seconds, we can do in about one. That's two orders of magnitude. So I'm happy to take questions from now on.